All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's get into chapter 27, and we look to complete the portions this in this class. Right? Okay, chapter 27, the blood of Jesus sealing an eternal covenant. Now, when we look, when we talked about covenants, we talked about the new and everlasting covenant, where the old covenant is gone. It was just a temporary covenant, but the, what Jesus did, he established a new and an everlasting covenant. That means the covenant will never come to an end, right? Let's look at a few aspects here. He sealed the new covenant with his own blood. Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20 says, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And we've talked about this. In the old covenant, there had to be blood. The new covenant, Jesus is saying, this is a new covenant I'm giving you. This is my blood that I will shed. He's talking about what he's going to do. The, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb of the new covenant. In the old covenant, what did the Passover lamb do? What did the blood of the Passover lamb do? Sorry? Forgiveness right. of sins. Uh, covering of sins. Uh, but more importantly, when the people of Israel put that blood on the doorpost, death passed by. To signify that, you know, death will not overcome us. Same thing here. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Jesus Christ is our high priest in the new covenant, representing us before the Father. We talked about this as well. Jesus is not sitting on the throne and saying, okay, now when, when am I ready to go down to, you know, to for my second coming? No, he's making intercession for us. He's our high priest in heaven. Jesus Christ is our testator of the new covenant. Jesus Christ sealed the covenant with his own blood. And Jesus Christ is the mediator or the enforcer of the new covenant. How did he seal the covenant? He said, we talked about it in Hebrews. He took his blood and he made atonement. Same thing what the high priest did, taking the blood, putting it on the altar. Here, Jesus takes the blood, goes into heaven, puts it on the altar. Same thing. Shadow, shadow tabernacle, real, real tabernacle. That's all it is. It's like we did the Easter production. No. It was the Easter production and then real. That's all it was. Only thing we know what happened. There they don't know what happened. In the old covenant, right? They were doing it, but God knew this is what I'm going to do, right? The blood of an everlasting covenant. So this covenant will not end. The blood speaks, Hebrews 12, 24, the, to Jesus, the mediator of the, of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Look at that. The blood of Jesus speaks better than that of Abel. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? God comes to Cain and asks Cain, Cain, where is your brother? Abel. Abel says, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. You, you are God. You should know. And God says something. The blood of your brother is crying out to me. See how the blood speaks? The blood of Abel is crying out to me. You didn't have to kill him. You could have just let him go. Why did jealousy come to you in such a way that you killed him that now his blood is crying out for revenge? So, Cain, this is what will happen to you. Wherever you go, you will be cursed. The land that God brings judgment upon Cain. So the blood of Abel spoke so much where God was able, God took it so seriously and brought judgment. The blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. So when Jesus goes to heaven and when he had put his blood on the altar, it spoke much more than the blood of, Jesus, than the blood of Abel. And you talk about speak, it means the authority. Abel's blood had authority. It, there, was, there was something in that 
where God, you know, if it was not important, God wouldn't have, you know, said anything to Cain. It was important. Blood of Jesus again speaks greater. The blood sprinkled and set in force in the new covenant. God saw, God heard the cry of the sh of the blood of Abel, and now as believers, we who have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ, the voice of Christ's blood calls out for all that Jesus Christ came to provide. As a new covenant people, we have the blood of Jesus sprinkled on us and his blood announces better things for us. Look at that. Just as when we speak the blood of Jesus over people, it's a voice that is greater. When we cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus, it's a voice that is greater than the voice of the enemy. Right? So it's, it's something that you and I must get into the habit of doing. It's not only once a while you say, okay, I'm covered by the... Keep saying it. I speak the blood. I speak the authority of the blood of Jesus. If you have any sickness in your body, speak the blood. Say, I, I command, I, I, I take authority over this sickness. I speak the blood of Jesus into my body. And I've heard of plenty of testimonies where people who have been, you know, who had heart diseases, were suffering from cancer. They are dying. The doctors have said, that, you know, six months. But they have said, you know, the blood of Jesus. I know of another testimony where, you know, the, the, the medicines are going inside. They're saying this medicine is the blood of Jesus that will bring clean cleansing. Remember, God can bring cleansing through medicines as well. Many times, you know, you know, if I'm unwell or if I'm sick, I'll just take a glass of water and I'll say, this is your blood, oh God. Bring healing into my body. Think it. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it takes some time. But the blood speaks. I've heard of many, many people where doctors have given up hope. I've shared that many stories, right? And there are plenty of them. Doctors have given up. Zero percent chances of survival. The doctors have said. Zero percent. Lung is not working. Liver is not working. Almost gone into a coma. There's no chance of living. They've got up and walked out of the hospital. They've done the x-ray. X-ray showing, hey, last time the liver was full of holes or full of problems on the liver and the lungs. We see that you have a new liver, new lungs. Who can do that? No doctor can do that. Only God can do that. He's a supernatural God. He can create miracles for you. But you've got to believe in the blood. Now just we go to the next chapter. Partaking in the Lord's table. Just that small, it doesn't even have to be grape juice, it can be water. But if you partake it in authority, it is his resurrection power flowing inside us. So let's look at this. The Lord's table is a proclamation of the power of Christ's death and resurrection. This is a token or a sign of the blood covenant God established for us. What was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? Circumcision. What was the sign of Noah's covenant? Rainbow. What is the sign of the new covenant? The Lord's table. Dead of Jesus. Yes. The proclamation of the Lord's table is a sign of the new covenant. Now, look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 34. It's a long passage, but it's a very important passage. Why? Because the people in Corinth were going through some problems. What were they doing? They thought the bread and uh, the wine that was kept there is breakfast. So they're eating. Imagine going into church. They're just taking the bread, eating you know, like tea and biscuits. You no, know, they're sitting around talking. They have disrespected the Lord's table. And so Paul writes this letter in 1 Corinthians and he's correcting them and rebuking them for the way that they have, you know, handled this whole the Lord's table. But he also tells them the consequences and how 
we can avoid this right look at this i'll just pick up portions right now in giving instructions i do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse now this is a church that is already seeing miracles flowing in the gifts of the spirit you are coming together not for better for the worse paul is saying first of all when you come together as a church there is division among you okay then when you come to eat the lord's table for in eating each one takes his own supper ahead of others one is hungry another is drunk that means what you see the mindset these people these believers have got up or maybe morning evening whatever they've come to church and they're filling their stomach with the food and they're drinking the wine now remember that that time they didn't have these small packets we have probably it was a big bowl of wine and people are just taking and drinking so he's saying here for what do you not have houses to eat and drink in all this you're doing you do in your house or do you despise the church of god and shame those who have nothing what shall i say to you shall i praise you shall i praise you in this i do not praise you for what i receive from the lord i give to you right and he goes on to say that let's go to verse 25 uh, no 26 for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes so as often as you do it you're proclaiming the death on the cross you remember the body that was so it's not only good friday you should remember the cross oh jesus you died so sad no every time you do it even in your home when you take the you know the lord's table you think of his body the body that was bruised the body that was beaten and wounded the body that was you could have carried like this you think of that body that took up all the pain and the suffering and you think of the blood that was shed that's what you think of and you think of yourself he saw you and me when he did this okay therefore whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord but let a man examine himself so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup right uh, let's go down 29 for he he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment upon himself not discerning the lord's body for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many asleep look at that for if we judge ourselves we will not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened by the lord that we may not be condemned with the world therefore my brethren when you come to eat together wait for one another if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest i will set in order when i come look at what paul is peter paul is saying he's saying see when you eat are taking the lord's table you are identifying with the death of the lord jesus when now you are coming as if it is food you are eating it you are filling your stomach and you are drinking it as though it's a party it's not a party he's telling them by doing it in this dishonorable manner that is why many of you are sick among you and many of you have even died because of the unworthy manner now let's look at what what how do we put it into context here the corinthian church they turned this whole time of the lord's table instead of making it a time of reverence and remembering the lord they turned it into a time of feasting and enjoying and paul was upset it's not a time of feasting it's a reverential it's a it's a price that the lord jesus paid yes there's a time to be joyful there's a time to enjoy right jesus himself he enjoyed right he the people came up to him why are you sitting with the tax collectors and uh, you know enjoying yourselves when everyone are fasting jesus says this is not the time for fast there'll come a time for that right but what happened was they were 
partaking in the wrong manner. And then what was intended to be a time of reverence and proclamation of his death and resurrection became more of a lunch feast. Can you picture that? What do we do now in church when we are partaking of the Lord's table? Some churches remove their slipper. Some churches so so much reverence. They don't look around. No, there's so much reverence because there was a price that was paid. Right? We think about the cross. We think about the blood. But look at this. They are having the Lord's table and they're discussing. So basically what we do in the tea time, they are doing during the Lord's table. Talking, discussing. They made it a feast. Instead of enjoying the benefits of the cross, which is healing, deliverance, and wholeness, many became sick and died prematurely. So now, it's a very important lesson for us. When we partake in the Lord's table, take it in reverence. There are two aspects I'd like to talk about. One is outward reverence, and one is inward reverence. Both are important. Why? I can't take, you know, I can't sit in the Lord's table slouching in my chair, you know, putting one leg on another and taking the Lord's table. And I can say, hey, my heart, my heart is fully tuned to God. Or I can have somebody else who's, you know, fully holy, holding that communion and he's saying, oh, but his mind is thinking about the beach. Or his mind is thinking about what to eat for lunch. But body is attention, position. Uh, not moving. But mind is somewhere else. Remember, God looks at the heart. Now we cannot say, okay, God is looking at the heart and put our legs on top of one another and you know just slouch back and partake. Nor can we say, you know, God is looking at me, so I have to be very reverential outside, but inside thinking about something else. Both are important. You've got to focus. See, how long is the Lord's table? Three, four minutes. We take, what, five minutes maximum. Focus your mind, your body, everything. Align it. Imagine Jesus said, okay, in the spirit, your body is, your body is healed. And imagine Jesus says that. Right? But, but you don't feel the healing. It's like that. Jesus is saying, you partake in a reverential manner, both ways, body and spirit. Then your healing comes. So it's very important to partake in this in a worthy manner. If you feel you're not ready, you feel that there are some things that you have to, uh, you know, see, we can always come and partake in the Lord's table at any time. And God is willing to forgive us. But if you feel that, you know, hey, I want to give some more time. I want to prepare myself and take this. That's also good. right? But let, let it not be a time of judging yourself. Remember, when we're coming, it's not about our works. We're coming to the cross. We're coming to, we are identifying with what Jesus did. Not what I did. We remember our sins. And we know that our sins are forgiven. The purpose of the Lord's table, we are proclaiming that on the cross, all our sins are paid for. So we have a right standing before God. The power of sin is broken. Jesus removed our sickness. That is, by his stripes we are healed. You know, there are times we can just partake in the Lord's table and healing can come immediately. There are times you can partake over a period of six months, healing can come. That's the power of the Lord's table. Jesus removed the curse of the law. The power of sin is destroyed. So we have complete mastery over Satan and his demons. We, have, we are redeemed. So we are God's purchased position. One drop of the blood of Jesus destroys everything Satan can do. So imagine when we partake, one drop of the blood of Jesus can destroy Maybe 20 years of jealousy and anger. It can destroy 30 years of unforgiveness. 
destroyed in a moment. Or it can destroy 10 years of hatred that you have towards somebody. Destroy. Or it can destroy the lust of the flesh or, the, or, or wrong habits. What you've been doing for 20 years in alcohol or drugs or anything. It can destroy in one minute, in just that moment. It can do it. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. One drop can destroy the work of the devil. And so when we partake in the Lord's table, we partake in an honorly manner. Right? As believers today, see, we do not fear weakness, sickness, and premature death because of wrongly participating in the Lord's table, simply because we have been taught how to do it the right way. Now, we feel for the Corinthians because, see, they didn't know. It was the early church. Right? They probably didn't know. How many of us coming from a different faith, we knew, okay, how to read the Bible. We knew how to pray. We don't know. We learn over time. So now, we may look back at the Corinthians and say, how can they do that? But for them, it was new. They didn't know it. But now we know how to do it, so we, there's no fear. We don't partake. Okay, am I, am I doing it the right way? No. We partake in confidence, knowing that God has promised to bring healing and deliverance to me. We partake simply because we have been taught how to do it. We know what we have to do each time we partake in the Lord's table. It is not that God is waiting for our smallest mistake to bring judgment on us. Rather, it's a time we celebrate and we bring joy to his heart and fear in the enemy's camp. It's a celebration. So when we are partaking, don't be fearful. Oh, if I don't do it right, then any sickness may come on me. No. What did happen to the Corinthian church? They didn't know. We know now. We are taking it in reverence and we know that God is rejoicing when we partake in this. But Paul recognizes here that in, when he talks about the cup and the bread, he says the cup of the blessings, cup of blessings, this is a cup that we drink, the cup that we drink is intended to administer blessing into our lives. And same thing with the bread. When we uh, partake in the body, it, it is to administer blessings into our life. Now, just a little bit portion uh, on idols and sacrifices. Right, First uh, Corinthians ten nineteen to twenty four. Can one of us please read that? First Corinthians ten nineteen to twenty four. What I'm saying then that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's will be. Yes. So now there's another problem here in the church in Corinth. What's happening? There is food sacrificed to idols. Now, just give you a little bit of background. In Corinth, there was uh, a temple with 1,000 prostitutes, male prostitutes, 1,000 female prostitutes. Now, these are all prostitutes, right? They would sell their body for money. And it was a holy thing because this temple was a temple which, if you involved in prostitution, that means you are fulfilling what the... God is asking you to do. So now, eating food sacrificed to these idols was a common thing. Everything was sacrificed to the idols during that time. Now, people have become believers. They've come into the church. After coming into the church, the Holy Spirit has come into them. They are flowing the gifts of the Spirit, healing, miracles, all that is there. Now they're partaking in the Lord's table. But they're also eating the food sacrificed to idols. So now Paul is bringing judgment on them. He's correcting them. What does he say? He's saying, see, 
the idol means nothing. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah, he writes, you go into the forest, you cut one tree, you take the wood, you make one shape, you give it eyes, you give it a nose, you give it a mouth, you give it a ear, you put some ornaments on it and you pray on it, but it doesn't do anything because it does not, it has eyes. So it is nothing. The idol is nothing. But the spirits working behind the idol are demonic spirits. Everyone with me? Right? The spirits that are working behind those idols are demonic spirits. So every idol that you see has demonic power working behind it. That is demonic power. So Paul is saying, now you go to the church and you're having the Lord's table. And the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus is inside you. Then you go and you eat food sacrificed to the idols. Now what you're doing is you're mixing what is of God's and what is of the devil. You're mixing it together. So it's like you're sitting on the fence. When I want God, I'll go to God. When I want the devil, I'll go to the devil. Now, can this happen? Is what Paul is saying. Think about it. He's telling the believers, you think. I'm not saying the idol is stronger than you. No, the spirits are there. But here, you're partaking in the Lord's table and you're doing partaking of food sacrifice to idols. So you're giving importance to both and both are there. So that's why you're not receiving healing nor are you receiving any gifts of the, you know, and the Holy Spirit is not working in your lives. And you're, 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 you're living in this place of guilt and shame because of all of this. So Paul is saying, we cannot mix true worship and idol worship together. We cannot do it. So what about us right now as believers? You know, we, we always say, no, greater is he who is in us than he is. Nothing will happen. God, all that is there. But knowingly, if I go and eat food sacrificed to idols, I am dishonoring my body. The Bible says, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it is where the Holy Spirit is residing. So why would I, being a believer, go and involve myself into food sacrifice with idols. Now later on, Paul tries to say, uh, you know, he, he, he's bringing the whole thing of eating meat and not eating meat. But what's the, what's the point here? He's trying to say, what you have to avoid, avoid it. Just because people are doing it, you don't do it. So right now, in the world that we are living in, bringing it to context, there will be times you will go to you know, maybe office gatherings. Many times it's happened when I was working in the corporate sector, they would have this whole program. You know, it would be any, you know, uh, festival of other faiths. And then they would give you the sweet. Politely, I've declined. I said, I don't want. Oh, you're scared because you're scared. You're scared that a demon will come and sit inside you. No. I'm not scared, but I'm looking at the flip side. I'm looking at honoring God because my God, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to defile my body with something that is not of God. So many times I've said no. Many times. Right? And they may have felt bad. They may have. No, sometimes I just tell them, no, I don't want to have it. I don't feel like having it. Very politely. Now, the mistake that we can make is. Start preaching to them. See, when Jesus died on the cross, now they don't want to know all of that. Meaning, they, they just want you to take the thing. So you don't have to explain every time. If they come and ask you, hey, why didn't you eat that? There's your opportunity to explain and to bring the gospel out. Right. Paul addressed this issue of food offering to idols. It's a spiritual aspect involved. He says we cannot mix the worship of God and the worship of demons. It may be culturally acceptable, but it's not helping and edifying. In the time in Corinth, it was acceptable. Now, still is acceptable. 
but it's not helpful in edifying. And I also need to consider the other person's well-being. Every need is met through the blood covenant. So before we go there, what would you do if your neighbor or your friends from other faiths come and offer you food that has been prayed over or, for, or prayed over by other gods? What would you do? Sorry? Politely refuse? What about the others? I'll decide at that time. Huh? What would you do? Would Pastor, you eat? If it's uh, sweet, I'll say no. I'm. I have sugar problem and I can't take it. <laughs> okay, you don't have to say sugar problem. Your words are powerful. You say no. Right? I say no. Thank you. Just be very polite. Right? Don't worry about what they will think. Don't worry about what they go and tell 100 people. No. What's more important? Honoring God or being more pleasing in man's eyes? Honoring. So it's okay. Right? You are following what the word of God says. There will be rejection. There will be people ridiculing and mocking you. That's okay. Let's move on. You're doing what is right. Yes, go ahead, Sanjay. Yes, Pastor. Just wanted to uh, add to to what you shared, Greg. Yes. Most of us, if like, especially people who don't drink and smoke, if someone offers us a cigarette or someone offers us an alcohol, we don't think twice to say no. We immediately say no, and we give it a, a full lecture or explanation why we don't drink or why we don't smoke. But for a little thing like this, we shouldn't really, you know, get uh, confused. I mean, with the same integrity. In yes. which we say no to alcohol and no to cigarettes. I think with the same integrity, we are, it's our free will to say no to something that doesn't resonate with our spirit. Very true. Very true. So that is, that's very good. Yes. So I'm not saying we should, you know, you know, just be timid and say, no, it's okay. I don't want. Stand your ground. Stand your ground and say no, but say it politely. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, kindness, all of that. But you stand your ground. Right? Like how Sanjay said, you know, somebody offers you a, a bottle of alcohol. You'll say, hey, no, this is something that I will not do because my body. Same way, when you, if it comes to this, say, no, it's, it's fine. Right? I don't want this because these are the things that I believe in. With the same integrity, with the same conviction. Must be able to share. Thank you, Sanjay. By chance, if we take it unknowingly, it might open doors to the enemy. Okay, now when we take it unknowingly, we didn't know, right? It, it's not going to affect us. Now, for example, I'm just giving you an example. We go to this market and we buy food. Now, we don't know whether that is a sacrifice to idol or not. We don't know. But we go by, we come home, we cook it, we pray and we eat. Now we can't sit and do research. We can't go and ask that person where all this, you know, this pieces of meat has gone. Right. So when you talk about Lucy, when you talk about unknowingly, right, it's not going to affect us because it's it's nothing. But when we know it's food offered to idols and we partake, then comes the problem. We are inviting the work of the enemy. But if we don't know it, we don't know it. It's not going to affect us. OK, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. OK, let's get into chapter 29, what the blood of Jesus does for us. Uh, we've talked about all of this. The blood of Jesus affects our life, cleanses us from all sins. Uh, we brought, we've actually gone through all of this. Uh, overcome the enemy. We are purchased by God. We are brought near to God. There's boldness. There's, uh, you know, his blood speaks. He's redeemed us, restored us. Reconciled us, we are justified, we are righteous. All of this, the blood of Jesus does for us. Cleanses us, makes us his children, calls us his children. Walking in the power of the blood of Jesus. We often hear the phrase, plead the blood of Jesus. And many times we take, you know, we take it and we rapidly and continuously repeat it. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. 
in order to invoke the power of the blood of Jesus. Now, if we know what it means, and we keep speaking on the blood of Jesus, then there is effect. If we don't know what it means, then there's no effect. Remember in the book of Acts, they were all praying over people who were possessed, the disciples, and they were getting delivered. But these seven sons of Sceva, the high priest, they said, hey, I want to become famous like these disciples. So what they did, they said, the same Jesus whom Paul is preaching, I command you devils to get out of this person's body. What do the devils do? The devils looked back and said, okay, Jesus, I know, he destroyed me on the cross. Apostle Paul, I know, because he's a great man of God. He's doing wonderful things. But who are you? <laughs> I've not seen you praying. I've not seen you believing in anything. So those demon-possessed men overpowered these seven, beat them and send them away. What was the difference? They both said in Jesus' name, but here the disciples knew the power of the name of Jesus. And here these seven priests didn't experience it. They just knew head knowledge. There was no experience. Okay, let me try to bring some more clarity. For example, God has healed you of one sickness. Miraculous healing. Okay, and I come to you and I say, you know what, I'm praying for healing. What will you do? You will get excited, no? Say, hey, God miraculously healed me, so I have to tell him. So I'll go and tell him. See, I don't know what you're going through. I went through the worst struggle in my life. Doctors gave up hope on me. But when we prayed in Jesus' name, I got new organs. God changed my life. I'm still living and we, I'm perfectly healthy now. So the same thing can happen to you. Why? Because it's experience. You're sharing from experience. It's not just head knowledge. That's also important. Sharing from experience. The same thing is here. When we experience the power of the blood of Jesus, there is no enemy or there's no work of the devil that can bring us down when we experience it. So something that we must do is we must fight for our covenant rights and pray and experience the power of the blood of Jesus. How can we experience? Four points and then we'll close. One, come into obedience. Obedient to God's word, obedience to his promises, obedience to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Two, believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. You've got to believe it. Hey, there is power in the blood of Jesus. It's not just some, you know, something that just happened. No, there is power in the blood of Jesus. Three, declare what the blood of Jesus has done for you. Now, we learned about all of this. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us. He's brought us, made us closer to God. He, we are righteous. We are justified. We have been bought by a price. The blood is powerful. The blood can destroy the works of the devil. Testify it. Speak over it, over your own life. Let your, the testimony of what the blood of Jesus be a weapon against the enemy. Finally, welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to stand on your behalf. And he's there. That's what he's doing. It's like this. If you're in the court, you've hired a lawyer to fight your case. You don't have to remind the lawyer, okay, lawyer, go. You have to talk now. The lawyer knows what he has to do. He's there for that reason. The same way, welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to do the work. He's our leader. He's our guide. He's our strength. He's our... Uh, you know, he's our convict. He brings conviction. He brings healing. He does all the work that he has to do. Welcome the work of the Holy Spirit into our life. The Holy Spirit will enforce for us everything Jesus has accomplished on the cross. So the devil will say, You are useless. The Holy Spirit will say, No, you are a child of God. The devil will say, You're a sinner. Holy Spirit will say, No, you are the righteousness of God. The devil will say, see, you're, you have already sinned. Holy Spirit will say, I've 
you are justified you're just as if you're not sin the devil will say you can never do ministry the holy spirit will say you can do you see what's happening here the enemy will come but the holy spirit will testify of everything that jesus did for us on the cross amen amen so we complete this course i i, I just pray that you know each one of you will apply these small points whatever you remember applied in your life and uh, i really enjoyed teaching this course uh, and i'll if you have any i'll probably put the final assessment maybe by today or tomorrow and and if you have any questions you can feel free to uh, ask chapter 24 of your, this course chapter 24 we didn't do it uh, no 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 in the last uh, page it okay. says by the blood of lamb there are quite a few things that are there we are cleansed we are forgiven reconciled and so on uh, which portion uh, is that? and the blood only pastor. okay okay the by blood. the blood yeah so, okay yeah the last thing it says by his blood we offer up our spiritual sacrifices yeah so any examples of what a spiritual sacrifice yeah so the psalmist says uh you uh, you know uh, we give a sacrifice of praise unto the house of the lord right so spiritual sacrifices are prayer worship these are all spiritual sacrifices that we do and by the blood we offer why why by the blood because the blood helps us gain entrance to the presence of god right so we bring a sacrifice of praise our worship our our reading of the word meditating on god's word these are all spiritual sacrifices right all right thank you everyone for uh being here in this course those online as well thank you so much uh, thank let's... you pastor for your teaching yeah god brother, bless you brother i have one small uh, doubt just clarify me that i don't know how to put the sentence i'll just read it out that statement how can we expect to remain sick or diseased and still fulfill the basic requirement of being a believer this is to lay hands upon the sick and see them healed man can only give what he he has received from God. If he is to represent eternal life, he must at least exhibit a healthy temporal life. What exactly it conveys, uh, brother? Which which portion is this? Which portion of scriptures? It's a, uh, it, uh, it just says Mark 16, 15, 20. What we have received from God, we'll be able to put it out. In the divine healing uh, subject, I just re read this. Is that if we are sick, we are we will not be able to pray for others or something like that? Does it convey something well, like that? See, we got to understand when when Jesus says, "By your stripes we are healed," yes. that is already done. It's now, all, yeah, here, yeah, it's already here, healed. yes. So the the aspect comes now is faith. Hmm. The work is already done. Yes, yes, yes. And when you look at even in Jesus's earthly ministry, people who walked by faith received miracles mm. so so i am not sure what your question is when it comes to this was yeah, it I, yeah it, if he is to represent eternal life if we are to pray for anybody who is sick mm. uh, uh, unless he is received that healing uh, through god's uh, word in in our, until i have received healing through god's word in my life Am, am I able to pray for others who are sick or? Uh... Yes. yes, yes, yes. See, uh, in the book of John, John writes, all these signs will, sorry, not uh, John, in the book of Mark, Mark, mm -hmm. he says, all these signs will follow those who believe. Okay. Huh. Right? So huh. if I believe that, now, for example, I have not prayed for healing, I, I don't need healing in my body. I'm fine hmm. by God's grace. Hmm. But those who believe, hmm. these signs will follow. What signs? They will lay hands on the sick, they'll be healed. And hmm. uh, they will cleanse the lepers. They will raise the dead. The, hmm. the only criteria is belief. Hmm. It's not like I should have experience in healing, only then I can pray for healing. That's not the case. So okay. all these signs, yes. Thank you, Sanjay. I can, I can uh, still pray for the people who are? Yes, 100%. and if I get that uh, thought of uh, praying for others, I can go ahead. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes. We're not doing it. Yes, we're not doing it on our own. We're doing it through the blood of Jesus. So no worries. 
Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, thank let's you. just close in prayer and uh, thank God for this entire uh, semester and this course. Father, we thank you for this entire course, the covenants, the cross, and the blood. And we thank you, Lord. We just speak your blessings, your covenant blessings, the blessings of the cross, and the power of your blood in each of our lives. That we will continue to walk in authority and dominion. And, and Lord, we just speak over each and every student here online and even those in person, Lord. We pray that your presence will continue to surround us and, and bless us, oh God. We thank you. I thank you for this entire course and this entire semester, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. I'll see you next semester. God bless.